So, so let me first a personal story. It seems that attack is a kind of uh, liaison here. Um, well, uh, not that I'm a member of attack, but uh, I I was invited at the time and I did some work on the Tobin tax. And so I was invited by the people of attack, and I was even invited by the French president, and I even went to the United Nations, where I was invited to speak for five minutes to the General Assembly about the Tobin tax, and everybody was asleep. So yes, they are not afraid of us. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's clear. Okay, well, one is, uh, the first thing I point I want to make is a kind of personal frustration. So I've been teaching uh, financial ethics for some years, uh, and so yeah, you think there's a crisis. The thing is really collapsed. So what, what you have to reckon is uh, when a system, financial system collapses, it has a huge impact on society. So it's very much very different than when, let's say, a car factory or a steel factory collapses. Why? Because it's, it's the spider in the web. Huh? It really sits in the nucleus of our economic system. And so when that collapses, the entire system collapses. Now, we were very close to a total collapse. Now, total collapse would mean that you would not be able to get money from the bank, no matter how much money you have. And don't think that has, this happened. It did happen in Greece. It happens in Argentina. Every 10 years, they have it in Argentina. So it keeps coming back. Yeah? Now, a total collapse means that nobody can get the money out of the wall. Huh? So you were limited to, let's say, two, 300 euros or something like that. Can you imagine what that means for an, for an economy and for a society? This is the type of collapse we're talking about. We were just that close to this collapse. But the payment system continued, luckily enough. So what happened to the education and finance? Well, nothing, eh? Well, so let me make an analogy. Suppose, uh, because this is what happened in, in Belgium, we lost, let's say, 85% of our banking system in a couple of weeks. Now suppose for a moment that you have 85% of the bridges in this country collapsing in three weeks. What do you think happens to the education of engineers? Hmm? What would happen to the theories they use? Yeah? I mean, I suppose we would ask questions, no? Nothing, nothing. Hmm? There's one place where I teach financial ethics, where they have a full course, and that's the only place that I know where people are trained in finance that they have a course on financial ethics. That's about it. That's the only place. Nothing changed. So that's a personal frustration. I leave it with you. But I, I think it's, it's really a scandal. So these people, and they are the best people we have at university, they train in finance because this is where the money is, they are still trained in a way as if there is no such thing as ethics. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So that's, that, I think, is a, is a big failure. Um, and, and now, I have a couple of critical remarks with what we heard so far, too big to fail. Um, yes, yes, that there's a problem, that is an issue. Uh, but one of the things you have to realize is this is not a separate issue. If you have large banks, it is because the scale of our economies has expanded so much. You have large banks because you have large companies. Yeah. There is no way that you can support a globalized economic system with lo local small banks. There is no way. Yeah. So I think you, you have to be aware of that. Then you have to make a choice. Right? It's not just a choice about big or small banks. It's a choice also about a big or a small economy. Now, do not underestimate what that means. If you look at economic historians, and you would reduce now the, the economic system to a local economic system, you would create immense poverty. Eh? Is, it is not the, the enormous increase in wealth that we have since the 20th century. Yeah? That has had enormous impact in many countries. Mm. I, I don't know if you're familiar with your Human Development Index, but if you look at the, the China of Mao Zedong, they had a, a human development index around 0 0.2 or something. Yeah? So, and, and in some regions, it was not even 0 0.1. In the beginning of the 20th century in Asia, it was 0 0.05, the human development index. What does that mean? That means that 90% of the population cannot read and write. Yeah? That means that, that people have a life expectancy of about 30, 35 years when they're born. That means that people live in chronicle chronical shortage, that you have always people living, the majority of your population lived on the edge of starvation. That was the situation in the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. On the March of Tong, we, we moved to 0 0.3. Now China is at 0 0.8. That is, we consider that more or less arrived. 
that's more or less a normal situation. Yeah. There's no way that China could have grown so fast without the globalization movement. No way. So, so be aware of what you choose. Be aware. I'm not defending here big banks. I'm not saying that it's good. I think it's a huge problem. Yeah. But big companies might also be seen as a huge problem, but it's part of a globalization movement. And if you throw it away, you throw away a lot, really a lot. So don't underestimate it. Well, so what do we need? Do we need new banks or do we need to change the old banks? Well, I would say we need both. We need both. I've been working with AT Bell um, since 92, um, very much aware of all kinds of new initiatives and so on, and I like it. I call it a kind of innovation. It's innovation in your society, innovation in your financial system. I think we need it. We need to innovate our society because of what comes up. Uh, there are all kinds of challenges, and they come very fast. Uh, the, don't underestimate it. We see it coming uh, year after year. Um, and so, so, yes, you need this type of innovation in these new initiatives like the new B initiative and, and, uh, and all the other uh, examples we got. I agree with that. But if you would rely on that, it will take ages before we are large enough. You need to change the existing system. Whether you like it or not, you will be simply too late if you want to build from the new banks. Yeah? You need both. So one of the things I did in my life at a certain point is not only did I work with Adebel, I still work with these people, but I also started working with large banks. And I tried to have a dialogue with them. I still do that. And try to change the internal struggle. Because, you know, bankers are not all crazy bad people. Yeah? They are people like you and me. Yeah? They live in a system. And some have ideas that mm, maybe we should change in this direction. And others don't agree. So you have all kinds of people like you have in every, in every place in society. So you find people in ba inside banks that you can work with in order to move a bank in a certain direction. So what did I do? What kind of direction am I talking about? And then I think is really part of also the central thing in, in this new banking system is I deeply agree with the idea that money is not a neutral good. That means money has a color. Yeah? Um, in the financial crisis, you, suppose you have a, a bike, uh, a bicycle. Yeah? You have a bicycle. And so what happened in the financial crisis is that people started selling you a bicycle without brakes. And then they were betting on the fact that you would collapse somewhere or that you would crash. That's what Goldman Sachs did. They sell you a good which they know that will crash and then they bet on the fact and they gain their money by the fact that you will crash. Only in finance can you sell such goods. In the real world, it would be impossible to sell a car without brakes. Impossible. So that's what I mean when I say that money is a kind of a neutral good in the normal perception. This has to change, fundamentally to change. We have to see where the money comes from, where it goes to. We have to know what the impact of money is. We have to measure the impact of money. Now, what I, what I do see, and, and I agree with the previous speaker, that there is now momentum for change even more than during the crisis, is that the big banks start thinking about that. They start thinking about impact. They start thinking about extending the idea of risk and return. Yeah, they see that it might be a risk to invest in coal. And I know big banks that have stopped investing in tobacco, that have stopped investing in coal, and it really costs them money. But they start to see that it makes a difference. And that it might be even good business to start thinking about these things. So we, we call that in finance now that we look more and more at ESG information, environmental, social governance information. These things are happening. Do we need them? Yes. Are they perfect? Far from. Is there still a long way to go? Tremendously long way to go. But work both ways. Not just the new banks, which I think you need, but also the old banks, which I think we cannot neglect and where we have to work with. That's my position. Thank you. Thank you.